Thank you for joining us for today's program, Genealogy and Records of Entry. My name is Lisa Crawley and I'm joined with Hannah Scruggs and this program is coming to you from the staff of the Robert F. Smith Explore Your Family History Center at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. As we celebrate Juneteenth, we'd like to take a closer look at those records that shed light on the lives of freedom's first generation, the generation in our families born enslaved and who lived to celebrate emancipation across America. So let's get started. In tracing our family history, we all come across intriguing records that fascinate us and captivate our attention. It could be a record that revealed you had a Civil War ancestor. And our staff has also worked with families who found ancestors that had a completely different surname at one time in their history. For instance, you may find a family that started out as Franklin's on the 1870 and 1880 census. And by the 1900 census, they're listed as Turner's and nobody knows why. An intriguing record can also be one that identifies a family member who died at an early age and whose memory is lost in their family's oral history. Intriguing records fit all kinds of different scenarios. So ask yourself, what kinds of intriguing records have you discovered in the course of your research? Our story today comes from the life of Holland Brooks, a spinner and mother of 10 children from Eastern North Carolina, who applied for a bank account at age 78 with the Freedmen's Bank. What makes her story so fascinating is what the Freedmen's Bank record revealed about what happened to her family during slavery. The record also identifies her parents who would have been born in the late 18th century. And we will also learn about the military service of Holland's son, William Brooks. And using reverse genealogy, we're gonna trace the family and bring them into the 21st century. In tracing the story of Holland Brooks family, some of the records that we'll be sharing this afternoon besides the Freedmen's Bank includes records from the Freedmen's Bureau, a North Carolina cohabitation record, US federal census records, vital records, and a legacy.com memorial webpage. So if you are back to the 1880 or 1870 census on your family tree, Ask yourself what emancipation era and antebellum era records may help you trace the family members of freedom's first generation or your Juneteenth generation. The term freedmen's first generation also comes to us from a professor, Professor Robert Francis Ings, of the University of Pennsylvania. His landmark book, Freedom's First Generation, explored the history of the enslaved and free black population of Hampton, Virginia during the Civil War era and emancipation. So the record that we'll be looking at today comes to us from the Freedmen's Bank. Over the course of nine years, the bank had 70,000 depositors and operated in 17 states and Washington, D.C., and it included some 37 branches. The bank was initially established and founded with the need to deposit the back pay and bounties of African-American Civil War veterans, and also to offer financial services to the newly freed population. And so the slide before you features a photo of the DC branch of the Freedmen's Bank. Freedmen's Bank accounts can be rich with genealogy information on their depositors. This is especially true for the records of Eastern North Carolina. Some of the general categories that you'll find on these records include the name of the depositor, where the person was born, where they were brought up, 
their residence at the time of their bank application, their age, their complexion, their occupation, and their, the name of their employer. They will also identify the spouse of that person, their children, and parents. And at the end, they will be either endorsed with a signature or they may have an X to confirm that signature. Some deposit accounts also identify former slave owners and plantations and regiment information of Civil War soldiers. So you need to ask yourself, is the Freedmen's Bank collection for you? So first off, have you identified your family back to the 1870 or 1880 census? Did your family live in or near a major Southern city, such as Baltimore or Raleigh or Vicksburg or New Orleans? And there's many cities, of course, that would fit that scenario. Are you a descendant of a Civil War veteran? And as we mentioned before, many of these accounts in the bank itself was founded on the deposits of Civil War veterans. Also, did your family have members who traveled during that time? We also find many, a number of depositors who were traveling preachers, particularly with the AME Church, as well as Chesapeake Bay Watermen. There were also two bank branches that were in Philadelphia in New York. And in those cases, we even find bank depositors who were European immigrants. In order to access the collection, you can do it in a number of ways. You can um, use Ancestry.com, which we all know is a paid subscriber base. But you can also use two free databases, and those are familysearch.org, and all you have to do is just Google familysearch.org and create your own account. And you can also use the free website, Heritage Quest, and that comes through the electronic resources of your local or county public library. So you can go to their websites or contact your local librarian to access Heritage Quest if your library system offers it. And now Hannah Scruggs, my colleague, will take you through Holland Brooks records. Thank you, Lisa. My name is Hannah Scruggs, and I will be continuing our genealogy journey through records about Holland Brooks. So the first record that we'll look at for Holland Brooks is the US Freedmen's Bank record, as was just previewed by my colleague, Lisa. So this is the transcription of the record. We'll look at the record itself in just a moment, but we wanted to show you this image first because it's a bit easier to read. And you can see the questions that it asks and the information that we can gather. So some of the most valuable information that we have um, would be her birth date, 1794, and she's 78 years old at this time. So um, 1870 when she's creating this account. We have her residence. We have the name of her parents, Ned Adams and Rachel, Rachel Brooks. And if we think to ourselves, if um, Holland was born in 1794, we know they must have been born sometime in the mid to late 1700s as well. We have a spouse for Holland named Isaac Bell. And then we have her children's names, Rachel, Sally, Reuben, Benjamin, Emily, William, Green, Louis, Alvina, and Lemon. And then here's the actual document itself. So if you are to find and locate a Freedmen's Bank document for your family, this is the type of, this is what it will look like. Um, and you can see right here, it says wife. We know that mostly men took out bank accounts, but it has her, since Holland is a woman, it crossed out wife and put husband, Isaac Bell. And it says deceased many years here on this. We'll go, we'll see more of this on the next slide but we can see some notes that were also made that weren't transcribed or put into the transcription. So we see notes about um, the children being deceased or sold. Um, and we also see notes about her father, which says died before she was grown. And then the mother died when I was a baby. And we also see the name of her brother, Reuben Adams. You have her mark at the bottom. 
So here we have the transcribed version that we've done with the notes included. Um, we have Rachel, her daughter, who is listed, is listed as dead. Sally sold Reuben. It says boy and then died. So we know that he died as a child. Benjamin sold. And then Emily, who we can assume is still living. Um, William, who died in the army. Um, and then we have Green or Greer, who came with her. And we have Louis, Alvina, Lemon. And then we know that she's using money from William, who is a Civil War veteran and who, who died in the Civil War. And then again, the notes with her parents. Her mother, Rachel, died when I was a baby and then died before I was grown. So all of these notes that were taken um, by the people creating this bank account for Holland Brooks are very helpful in our genealogy search and learning more. We, these are extremely detailed records. This is not the type of detail we always get from a record like the 1870 or 1880 census, which is taken around this time, because we have this detail about these children that are deceased. And we also have information about children that she lost during slavery because of being sold. So this is very, very detailed. These are very, very helpful records for us um, as we're seeking to learn more about our families. So again, some of the highlights here, um, we call the slide Holland Brooks up close and personal, because this is the type of information that we get this personal information that we get from, from these records of intrigue. So we identify three generations of her family, right? We have her parents, we have her children, and then we have Holland and her husband. Um, we have information about her children. And then we learn that money from Mrs. Brooks' account came from William's military service. Some notes that we might take if we were researching or while we're researching Holland Brooks, um, if Holland's mother, Rachel, died when she was a baby, who would have raised Holland? We don't know the answer to that question, but it's something that we might note to look into later or to have at the forefront of our minds if we're doing more research back in time. We also have um, the question, if Holland's parents were born in the mid-1700s, what generation were they in, in the Americas? Were they the first generation? It's very possible because the um, transatlantic slave trade was still legal and going strong in the 1700s, um, but, or had they been there for a long time? So that's a question that we would have as well. Where does her surname come from? We saw that her father's last name was Adams, but her mother's last name was Brooks, but where does that Brooks come from? We don't know. And then we also have that her husband's last name was Bell. She's still going by Holland Brooks and we don't know why that is necessarily. So here's a way to connect a couple of different records to each other. We know that we have many different types of records when we're, we're creating our family trees, but we don't always talk about the ways that the records connect to one another, overlap, or how they can make each other make sense. So here's an example. This is a Freedmen's Bureau record from New Bern, North Carolina. The Freedmen's Bureau helped freedmen receive back pay or pensions for their service in the Civil War. So we see this um, record for William Brooks um, and for Holland Brooks is listed as, as his mother. Um, we see that he served in the 35th Infantry and that he was owed $126 um, on March 14, 1870. So we see just days later, um, Holland Brooks goes and opens a bank account, right? That in this bank that's often saved for um, the Civil War veterans with this money. Um, and we also have on this record, the name of the infantry that William was in, as you can see, we've highlighted the, U the 35th US Colored Infantry. And then again, the amount he received, the amount that Holland would have put into the bank. So this is a way we can look at this record and better understand the record um, from the Freedmen's Bank. It gives us context and they confirm one another. So just a little information about the US 35th Colored Infantry. Um, the original name was the first North Carolina Colored Volunteers. 
It took enlistments from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. They trained in New Bern, North Carolina, and they fought in the Battle of Alistair, the largest Civil War battle in Florida. Another record that we have that we are able to connect between the Freedmen's Bank and um, another record that we have that we're able to connect with the Freedmen's Bank record is the cohabitation record of Holland Brooks and Luke Pittman from August of 1866. So we have state of North Carolina in Pitt County. Um, and we know that the North Carolina General Assembly um, passed legislation in 1866 calling for the freedmen and women to have their um, in your quotes, slave marriages recorded because sla enslaved people um, were not legally allowed to be married. So these cohabitation records provide us some information about relationships formed during slavery. Um, and it says before me, Pitt County Clerk of the Court of Pleas and Quarter Session for said county personally appeared Luke Pittman and Holland Brooks, residents of said county, likely slaves, but now emancipated, and acknowledged that they do cohabitate together as man and wife, and that they and that said cohabitation commenced on the 10th day of June, 1850. So this is a record of their relationship before the end of emancipation um, in, in 1850. So they had been together by the end of the Civil War for 16 years. Um, and they were just now having their relationship recognized. And again, it's another record that we have that has um, Holland Brooks named um, and links her to, to her husband. And so um, cohabitation records are extremely helpful. Seven states have them, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, and 20,000 records survive for North Carolina Craven County, North Carolina, having the cohabitation records that exist. So tracing Holland Brooks into some of the more well-known and sort of bread and butter genealogy records, we have found her in the 1900 and the 1910 census. So we see on the left, um, Holland Brooks is listed as the mother of Lemuel Pittman in the 1900 census on the Freedmen's Bank record, we saw that she had a son named Lemon. Um, so we figured that those might be the same people. Um, and then we, we find it says Lemuel or Lemon Pittman again in the 1910 census with his wife and children. Um, and then any of his children could be used to trace that Holland's family line further into the future. So we're gonna do just that momentarily. We have another image of these records just so you can see it more clearly. Holland in this 1900 census is listed as being 93 years old. We saw on the Freedman's Bank record that she listed her birth year as 1794. So actually she may have been even uh, 10 years older than that. So we're not sure that at that, um, that time, but that's what is listed on the census. And then you can see Lemuel's household and then the other children, Lewis, um, and then um, his wife, um, and as well as a niece, uh, Susan Pittman, and then a brother-in-law, uh, Edward Davis. So we're getting a good snapshot of the people living in the household and the family at this time. This is from the 1910 census. Lemon, it's listed as Lemon um, instead of Lemuel, which is what we saw last time. But again, the wife's name is the same. Some of the children's name are the same, Lewis. Um, but we can hear that at this point, Holland may have passed. Again, she was 93 or potentially 103 in 1900. Um, and so by 1910, she may have passed. So here we have a record for a Lewis Pittman, a death certificate specifically, that lists being 81 years old and having died in 1932. Um, this is important for us. We saw that Holland had listed that she had had a son named Lewis on her Freedman's Bank record. So again, this is another record that connects back to the Freedman's Bank. And this, on this record, it lists Holland Brooks as the maiden name of the mother and Luke Pittman, which is the name that we saw in that um, cohabitation record as the name of the father. Um, and he's listed as 
passing at age 81 in 1932. So again, these records help confirm that we're on the right track when we're doing our research and bring the family further into the future. We also have a 1940 census. So if we search for another one of Lemuel's children, Ernest Pittman, we see him in the 1940 census. He's 39 um, and his children may, or he has, sorry, he has a wife named May and then sons named Henry Theodore Ernest Jr. and Jesse and two daughters, Lillian and Clara. So these people are, the children are children in 1940, meaning that there's a chance that they could still be alive today or have uh, recently passed and have descendants that are still living. This is a death certificate for Ernest Pittman, who was one of the children of Lemon and Jeanette Pittman that we saw in the 1900 and 1910 censuses. Um, this death certificate was from 1963 we see that his date of birth was around 1900. Um, and this gives us another record in tracing that family line forward. This is confirmation that he is, Ernest is linked to this line of Holland Brooks and her family through Lemon or Lemuel. And we also saw again on that 1940 census that he's listed with his family um, and the, fam the younger family members, as I said earlier, give us people to trace further into the future. And we found a descendant of Holland who just passed recently um, in 2013, Lillian Pittman um, Dixon, who's the daughter of Ernest Pittman, son of Lemon or Lemuel Pittman, who was the son of Holland Brooks Pittman, who was the daughter of Rachel and Ned Adams. So we have this line that goes from the 1700s, the mid 1700s through the 2010s using um, that Freedom's Bank record as an anchor to give us a lot of the information sort of as our midway point record to give us this information um, that helps us connect both of those, of those lines. So the community curation platform is a place where you can share your family stories and intriguing ref records. Um, it's communitycuration.org. We'll put the link in the notes, um, but we encourage you to count and to share your family story and to share your intriguing records that you may have found doing your own family research. We also encourage you to help us with our transcription project. We have um, the Freedmen's Bureau records that we're working on transcribing. Um, it's volunteer through the Smithsonian Transcription Center. So we'll also put that link as well in the notes. We also encourage you to visit our virtual exhibit, Polly Murray's Proud Shoes, a classic in African-American genealogy, where we celebrate and um, discuss the legacy of Polly Murray's book, Proud Shoes, which is a story of her family. Um, our virtual exhibit can be found on our website and we have an in-person exhibit on the second floor of the museum, the Explorer Family History Center. Resources listed here, we have places to access the Freedmen's Bank and Family Histories, as well as information on the USCT 35th Regiment and the Poplar Grove Cohabitation Records. We'll also put these links into the um, notes. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. To sign up for a virtual genealogy session and any questions that you may have, please contact us at familyhistorycenter at si.edu. And thank you.